Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today I have a returning guest, Jim Limber Davis, uh, coming in from Indiana. He's a voluntarist, anarchist, and author of Liberty Defined and Morality Defined. Uh, Liberty Defined was his first book. We, um, we talked about that, uh, I think it was last year. And uh, we had a nice conversation, so this time we're going to talk about a second book, uh, try to uh, help promote that. Um, so you can find uh, his his information and, and what he's doing on his website, jimlimberdavis.com. He's on Facebook uh, under Liberty Defined and uh, on Twitter at Jim Limber Davis. Um, so, uh, Jim, thanks a lot for coming back on the show. No, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while since we last talked, and I know you've been uh, your busy guy. You know, you, you, and aside from writing these books, he's also writing uh, uh, other books on uh, some Star Wars fiction, right? That you uh, that you've been uh, you've been up to. So, uh, so you're a busy guy. <laughs> you know, creating content is a never ending uh, uh, endeavor. And creating content and uh, just trying to get my thoughts on paper so I don't forget them. Always a never ending battle. Right, right, right. You know, I feel like as as a writer like i've um you know i've written a bunch of articles and blog posts and and you know i'm i'm kind of about to publish like an an e flip book maybe a kindle book and um and i feel like you know not only writing but also um podcasting it's kind of like um taking a snapshot of of the present and our thoughts you know and how we think and uh you know it's just a way that people in the future like maybe our kids or grandkids can look back and see exactly you know what we were thinking, <laughs> and uh, I think it's a I think it's a great idea for people to do this kind of stuff, and I encourage anybody you know to it's, you know that's why the internet is so awesome you know anybody can start a YouTube channel right anybody um, can post stuff on you know and just get get whatever your message is you know I guess right or wrong good or bad you know let let the market decide of, of what what your message is is all about you know. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Why not? If you don't uh, try something, you won't know. So, right, right, right. Exactly. So, um, so can you take us into uh, morality defined and uh, and what you um, you know what your a uh, uh, goal or objective is in writing that book? All right. Well, uh, before before I get into that a little bit, it, it's got to be important for the uh, listeners to understand that. Uh, Everything I do is in terms of economics. So <clears throat> I know uh, it, it's been often stated in a lot of the uh, liberty circles that all human interaction is uh, economic interaction. And uh, I understand that uh, Mises was uh, the one who wrote about this and called it praxology. I have no idea how he came to that. I don't understand. I've never read any of his works beyond uh, snippets and quotes floating around the Internet. Uh, in fact, everything that I've done – uh, pretty much for liberty defined and morality defined is derived from my own deductive reasoning that I started uh, around 21. It's just a culmination of everything that I've done. Um, what I have read uh, are history books, uh, directly copied correspondence from historical figures and uh, other protected materials stored in uh, various state and local archives around the United States. <clears throat> I didn't uh, begin listening to Molyneux or, or uh, Rose or, or anybody else. Uh, I never read a Rothbard bur book um, or anything uh, until I had uh, the vast uh, bulk of uh, my own understanding already in place. Uh, so before anybody anybody listening, before you start criticizing me about what I'm about to share, please understand that what I have devised is not built upon uh, the directly discussed ideas of liberty, morality, self-ownership, or the non-aggression principle beyond – and these topics being stated as inherent, immutable, or of divine inspiration, or anything else anybody has had to say about this. Like I said, all I did was read uh, correspondence and, and personal letters and notes and uh, old uh, government documents, um, struggles and, and stories of history and how different the people, why they rebelled, so on and so forth. I didn't read the philosophy parts. I just read the actual events parts and pieced together what everybody was trying to do, why they were trying to do it, why it didn't work, and tried to figure out the little holes that they failed to fill in, like the little plot holes in the stories and why certain things that worked or didn't work. So 
what I did was take those ideas and just break them apart. Now, I've heard about the universally preferable behavior, and I understand the basics of it, though I've never actually gotten into the precise understanding of it and figuring it out entirely. Um, and uh, so with this in mind, um, it's important that that people listening – need to understand that I knew nothing of these other concepts before I started crafting these ideas. And that's, that's important because as we start discussing topics with other people in debate or just, just general discussion, uh, we end up, um, uh, we end up immediately jumping to, uh, definitions of terms that we first learned or how we most commonly associate those terms. A lot of people will jump all over my bones about, I'll say morality is objective. I, I did not say objective morality. I said morality is objective. It doesn't always mean the same thing. Um, so if you take those two words, you split them apart. It just means there's a clear goal for morality. I don't. I don't define it. I don't get into uh, what other people have had to say about objective morality or subjective morality or whatever it is. I started from scratch. Okay, so with that in mind, this is uh, this is uh, kind of what I came up to, and um, I'll have to start with self ownership uh, in order to build up to everything. So I will give a cap, I guess, of what uh, morality basically is in a nutshell. Um, pretty much, uh, morality is about recognizing. Uh, the value that we place on ourselves on our, as individuals, uh, it's about uh, wanting that value respected. Now, the amount of value you place on yourself doesn't matter. What matters is the respect concerning other individuals. The value is absolutely open for interpretation because at the end of the day, how you value yourself versus somebody else, you are almost always going to choose yourself over somebody else. Unless you're taught some sort of uh, special code of honor, maybe um, it just but your value for most people it's always going to be themselves over others. And I know that sounds kind of selfish, but if we don't take care of ourselves first, we can't take care of anybody else. You don't put your your uh, oxygen mask on on an aircraft going down uh, before you try to help somebody else. You might pass out, and then you won't be able to help anybody. So what good is is not taking care of yourself first if you want to take care of other people. You have to come first in order to provide. So we want that value respected, and um, we understand that others must have similar concepts. So we extend in some fashion of communication our ideas and what others uh, would ex should expect of us. Uh, we set the groundwork for that, and we make sure that our respect of other individuals uh, their consent to being interacted with has to default at 100 percent it can't it can't be anything less than that um, because if it's anything less than that then the whole thing falls apart then you start making justifications the only time that it's okay for that consent to not be 100 percent to interact with somebody else um, it's going to be in terms of of self-defense uh, now a lot of people will break that apart and they'll say no you have to violate somebody's consent. Now, nitpicking about it, and you have to violate somebody's consent uh, in order to communicate with them. Well, that should be an understood. If there's anything that's going to be inherent, it's going to be that understanding there, where individuals need to un need to recognize a necessity for being able to at least communicate on basic levels with other individuals to, f to recognize boundaries. That's it. And that's what morality in practice, the non-aggression principle in practice becomes. It becomes a boundary. So how so, so that's important, but a lot of people will tell me, well, that doesn't make any sense. It it you can't just go make stuff up like that. Uh, and I'm gonna tell them, actually, yeah, I can. I can make up whatever I want, and if you want to agree to it, that's fine. But this is and this is again all based on economic terms or in uh, economic ideas, I should say. So going all the way back to the beginning, <clears throat> liberty is, um, or a morality is rooted in the idea of self-ownership. Okay. Again, in terms of economics and a lot of people will say, 
self-ownership is inherent or immutable or, or divine inspiration or whatever, but they won't actually be able to define it. And you have to be able to define self-ownership if you're going to understand morality. So self-ownership is the highest claim of property ownership possible by a reasoned, capable, sentient individual. Uh, wanting the value he or she recognizes or places on their life to be cared for and, and, and by their choices. Um, this is what the definition of self-ownership should be entirely about. It's about taking care of the responsibilities of yourself, maintaining uh, – the individual should maintain all aspects and care and responsibility of his or her life. Okay, um, And this happens by the individual refining his or uh, her three natural resources – to provide for or satisfy the four basics of life. Um, and I'll get to those in just a moment here. Um, think of it as the sentiment behind homesteading. If you take care of everything and make improvements and maintain and improve the quality of your life through your efforts alone by refining your three natural resources, your time, intellect, and labor to – to provide for your sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness. So long as you're doing that and not allowing anybody else to do that for you without some sort of voluntary exchange, meaning that meaning that uh, you say you go get a job, you need a house, you can't build a house yourself, but you can have you have other skills, so you go get a job and you sell you sell and refine your time, your intellect, and your labor to earn money or credits or whatever it is you do at some at some big business. Then you take some of that portion of that wealth that you earned, that money, those credits, and then you trade it to somebody else who can build a house for you. You're still taking care of yourself. You're still providing for yourself. But if you – if somebody else provides for you and you just allow them to, then they dictate terms, but you don't want to do anything. And they, they can dictate terms and say, now you have to do this for me and you accept that. Then they have a claim over your life because you allowed that to happen. Kind of the way government works. Government steps in, says we're going to do this. We always talk about consent when it comes to government. People like to say social contract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Social contract is a, preser a perversion <clears throat> uh, from this. It's a top-down uh, collective to the individual to coerce conformity. It's exactly what the issue is with concerning. Uh, the, having the highest claim of, of ownership over yourself, over your, over your, your, your own person or individual. Um, <clears throat> so, if so, so, the social contract being a perversion of this, um, the individual responsibilities to provide uh, for themselves, including things like uh, travel, nutrition, maybe contract enforcements, uh, those are all forfeited at gunpoint. Um, and it's it's in, that's always what people fail to recognize when it comes to um, when it comes to, uh, to to property ownership. And so they they claim they claim they're free. They claim everybody has a right to do everything, but they don't. They they don't actually own themselves, but they do own themselves. They own themselves because they're free to leave, but they don't own themselves because they have to conform to everything else here. And they people don't recognize. Their, their, uh, uh, the means that people who support government, I should say, do not recognize their ability to, uh, or their, their actions, the unintended consequence, uh, yeah, the unintended consequences of their actions uh, on other people. So people want government to do this. They claim this jurisdiction over this uh, this area, and then they want, they want to tell people in the same breath that yeah, you're free. You just have to follow these rules. And it becomes an issue uh, that way. Uh, so, in order for in order for people to understand the rest of morality and then liberty, which um, you have you have to understand self -owner, self ownership self ownership again being the sentiment behind homesteading. You provide for yourself entirely, either creating and acquiring everything you need to maintain your life and or improve its quality. Or you do that in a combination with trading for what you need from other people peacefully. That's that's self ownership. That's how you take care of yourself. <clears throat> so this getting into um, 
uh, understanding self ownership then must then be taught to the next generation. And we had uh, previously talked about uh, in other conversations um, about how uh, children are actually property. A lot of people will just want to skewer me for that. But again, in economic terms, and since all human interaction is economic interaction, and property ownership has to start with somewhere. How can you own? How can how can anybody own something? A pencil, a car, whatever, if they don't first own themselves. So if if you can if the individual can own himself, then anything that individual creates by a refinement of his time, intellect, and labor, even if it is with another individual, then there's joint ownership over that that whatever's created whatever the refinement of those three natural resources is. So a parent must understand this and be able to explain this concept in the offspring. And because the parent makes a decision which results in the creation of a new life, incapable at early stages of its development up to as many as maybe even 10 years or more, <clears throat> that parent, those, those parents are still providing the basics of life for that offspring. Now, some people will say that this is supposed to be some sort of a state of stewardship or, or some other similar idea that work in place of ownership of a child, and I disagree with that, as the entire premise is built around economics and the idea of ownership, starting with self-ownership. <clears throat> and again, self-ownership is directly tied to economic activity, since all human activity is economic activity. And unlike slavery and, um, and stewardship, ownership of children is more what parenting is all about, and the recognitions of the child's development into a self-owned individual capable of claiming the highest ownership possible over him or herself by the teachings of his parent or her parents or guardians. Basically, uh, the parents teach the child the lessons necessary to maintain, uh, to refine their three natural resources in order to s satisfy their four basics of life. So the parents, if they understand this concept, they refine their time and let them labor. To maintain, to satisfy their their needs and requirements for sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness, they teach their children this. And with each successive lesson, the child becomes or tries to become more and more independent. It's not a matter of recognizing specific boundaries or um, creating some sort of test for the child. It's a matter of recognizing what the child learns and knows, and the parent trying to to uh, help encourage that or better lessons and teachings so that the offspring is able to fully care for him or herself. That's, that's, why, that's why it doesn't seem like guardianship for me as far as I'm concerned does, doesn't work as well. Stewardship doesn't work as well because if, if we don't own ourselves and then we don't own the – the, the, uh, excuse me, the uh, refinement of our time, intellect, and labor, which then would be the production of offspring. If we don't own that, who owns that? This collective of people that has claimed jurisdiction over us so they can just come in and take our children away from us because they don't agree with what we're doing? I don't agree with a lot of things that a lot of people do. And a lot of people will say it's immoral for me to not stand up and do something about those poor children who have this horrible – mutation of the flu virus and their parents only praying over them instead of taking them to a hospital. Okay. I'm not sorry at all for not stepping in and violating those parents' rights. It's a crappy world, not because people choose to make decisions to care for themselves and their children in a way we wouldn't agree with. It's a crappy world because People presume the right to interfere into the affairs of others and not recognize their consent in, in whole, 100%. It's a diff there's a difference between, between somebody just beating the crap out of their kid because they're trying they, – they, they're mad, they're angry. You know, it, it's, 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 it's not the same thing for a 35-year-old man to beat a 10-year-old boy because the 35-year-old man doesn't understand how to explain to the 10-year-old boy how to do something. There's a difference between that and then just praying that your kid will get well from this freak strain of the flu virus. It's, it, it, there's there's two, different, two different things. A lot of people say, no, there's no difference because you have to take care of the children. No, no, there, there's a difference. There's a difference. 
However, I'm not defending both. I'm not defending the right of the parent to just to beat the crap out of their kids or just let them die. It's just what right do we have to actually interfere with somebody else if we believe in self ownership a hundred percent of the way? If we understand self ownership in this fashion, yeah, a lot of people will die. But how many people will die under this version of understanding, under this under this set of ideas, versus what we currently have, where wars are started for no other reason than people just got involved in somebody else's life and told them to I'm going to take over this because you obviously don't know how to do certain things. I mean that's the that's that's the number one problem with with people. They get involved with other people's lives. They don't think about the unintended consequences and they're not willing to just leave things well enough alone. Just let it go. You know what? If five children die because their parents refuse to listen to reason, you can try to reason with them as much as you can, but the moment you uh, you initiate any sort of violence or aggression against them whatsoever, you've basically forfeited your right to 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 any sort of um, peaceful or civil discourse with with the people that you don't agree with, because it's it's along the same lines of thinking as I'm just doing my job. Mm-hmm. So you're just going to decide to violate the the consent of parents who choose to do something differently than you. Okay. All right. That doesn't work that way because the children are the property of the parents. It's terribly unfortunate. Certain things happen. You can't change the entire world. You can't, you can't uh, do it by yourself. You can always be the example you want to see in the world, but you can't go around and think that you have the moral high ground if you want to get involved in other people's lives and violate their consent to being interacted with and then still claim that self-ownership is the way to go. So by teaching, by teaching uh, home, the sentiment of homesteading as the basis of uh, self-ownership, the parents can then uh, teach that to their children, and that sets a clear expectation – of what the process of parenting is all about because we all want to see our legacy, our offspring, our children keep going. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a lot of us just have this thing where uh, they want to make sure they leave their positive mark on the world. Many of us just want to do more than just simply exist and survive. So that's how you do it. But if you just wanted to exist and survive, that's still how you want to do it. So getting, making this transition from self ownership, to what morality is, then we have to understand what liberty is. So self-ownership is basically the essence, the sentiment sentient, um, sentiment of homesteading uh, yourself or oneself. And parenting is the teaching of the children how to homestead themselves, how to take care and maintain themselves. Liberty is about the exercising of self-ownership. And this is what liberty defined is all about. Now, none of these actually come before the others. They're kind of a... Kind of, I guess the best way I can explain this is that they're more or less a a uh, I don't know kind of like a triangle where all three parts there's your self ownership on one corner and liberty on another corner and morality on another corner and you have to have them all together in order for them to work. So understanding self ownership, then now how the self ownership and practice work. Well, that's what liberty is all about, and liberty is about maintaining. The highest claim of ownership over the individual by refining the individual's three natural resources in order to provide for or satisfy the four basics of life. Now, the three natural resources are again our time, intellect, and labor, and in that order specifically, because we all have lots of time. It takes time for us to develop intellect, and then it takes additional time to refine that intellect and create and excuse me, and uh, generate labor to refine the time and the intellect that we had to make a product, okay? Now, the four basics of life are sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness. Now, sustenance, shelter, and security, those first three have to come first in no particular order, always before happiness. Now, this is due to the fact that one can survive and not be happy while being happy 
raises self-esteem and value and worth that is recognized in the concept of self-ownership. So um, <clears throat> happiness, yeah, you can you can live, you can survive, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, surviving, I guess, is, is, is not the same as, as um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, uh, flourishing. Mm, yeah, thriving. So, yes, that's, yeah, thriving, thank you. Um, now, <clears throat> everything everyone does to refine their three natural resources is about creating wealth. All refinements of these three natural resources are the creation of wealth because all refinements of such produce something that is useful in the satisfaction of one or more of these four basics of life. And before the first naysayer pops up and says, what about suicide? I got you covered. <laughs> yes, this includes suicide and genocide and the general destruction of others and their property based entirely out of distress and indoctrination, etc. I mean, these kinds of refinements still measure up to the definition of all refinements of the three natural resources being wealth because they always have some root in improving happiness by ending despair through suicide or revenge by hurting others to improve feelings of injustice. That's, I mean, it's, it's warped thinking, but it still fits the mold because of the reasoning being used. So the problem is simply choosing to employ the shallow end of logic and not take into account the law of unintended consequences when choosing suicide or, or hurting other people because of some injustice being served or wanting to get rid of despair in yourself, in, 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 your, in your mind. Now, um, that, and that's interesting. I, I almost forgot about that too, the law of unintended consequences. It's something else that I discuss from time to time concerning taxation. And how the act uh, right there is directly responsible for human suffering in so many ways. So if you refine your three natural resources at some some nine to five job and they pay you with some sort of credits or money or currency or whatever it is, the government takes a portion of that. They've effectively made you a slave for whatever percentage of your time that was required for that. And the more they steal from you, the more they take from you, the more the harder you have to work, the less time that you have to actually pursue happiness. And the more time you have to use pursuing um, sustenance, shelter, and security. So government actually – I mean if it's because if you choose to be happy first before providing sh uh, shelter, security, and sustenance, then you're going to – you're not going to live very long. So most people cut out the happiness first and the little little things, the people who are generally responsible. And I should I should take that back. I don't mean generally responsible. I mean the people who want to prolong their lives for a chance at being happier at some point in time in the future. That's what typically most of us do. We, we, we forego the, the pleasures and work a little bit longer, a couple more hours each week in order to compensate for a lot of those things. Or we go to school instead of to, to, get, a, to get a higher paying job. Not necessarily a better job, but a higher paying job in order to, on the off chance, maybe – being able to afford better or some amenities or better amenities in the future. So, and uh, well, so just because something doesn't, cre uh, something created doesn't appear to have any value, uh, any particular value to, to you or me doesn't mean that it wasn't created with a purpose. So everything that we create, everything we refine with our, in with our uh, time, intellect and labor is always, is always valuable. It's always wealth. Now, the purpose of so many things uh, that are created uh, is to enable happiness. And since happiness, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder, we tend not to recognize such trivial uh, trinkets in the possessions of others. Uh, this is a failure, I think, of so many who claim that possessions can easily be replaced. Uh, yeah, that's true. But uh, what is not recognized is the lost time uh, used to create those little trivial trinkets. And when things are lost to fees or taxation, the refinement of one's three natural resources to create or acquire peacefully and honestly uh, these um, material possessions or material wealth makes these um, individuals victims of theft or taxation. Um, they're basically slaves for the duration of time spent to refine their three natural resources in order to have their wealth to satisfy whatever basis of life they acquire such wealth for. Um, and after going over that, I think it's probably a good idea to explain and be very clear about this here. All refinements of an individual's time, intellect, and labor are wealth. And wealth is anything that can directly satisfy one or more of the four basics of life 
or be traded to acquire such that can. Now, wealth can be divided into two separate categories, real and artificial. Uh, real wealth is any wealth that can be used or consumed directly to satisfy any of the four basics of life. Artificial wealth is going to be used almost exclusively for the exchange of real wealth. Um, fiat currency is a prime example of, of uh, artificial wealth. Not much good for anything other than the exchange of uh, real wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, real wealth, all real wealth can be artificial wealth or take on the roles of artificial wealth. Um, like wheat bundles uh, used to be traded uh, in colonial America, precious metals, um, whiskey, those sorts of things, cigarettes in a prison. That's all real wealth because it can be directly consumed or used to satisfy sustenance, shelter, security, or, and or happiness. It, it's, it's good for those things there. Just like nails used to be currency in um, the frontier. As the frontier in the, uh, in the United States uh, kept pressing farther and farther west of the Mississippi. I mean, little things like that. Just little tiny things. We don't think about that today. But those used to be traded. And that, that's real wealth because it has a direct purpose. So people would go and take down cabins and take the nails out of them, take them with them before they moved on west because nails were hard to come by a lot of times. Little, little things like that. So, uh, oh, and um, probably a point of interest that I need to mention is that uh, people will say, well, gold is just a currency. Gold is just – it's just wealth. It's, it's wealth because it's 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 a commodity that's used for trading stuff. Well, yeah, gold is real wealth, but not because of traditional reasons um, that make it a stable currency. Uh, okay, so a lot of people say it's because it's finite, it's um, difficult to acquire, you can't uh, reproduce it very well, so it makes a, it makes a much better currency than anything else. Well, gold is real wealth because it satisfies one or more of the four basics of life. Now. In ancient times, gold was typically, and other precious metals were typically just used uh, and held because they were easy to trade and they had aesthetic value. You know, they were they were beautiful. They were they could you make artworks out of them. Well, today, gold and other precious metals are used in electronics, preserving milk, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and I say uh, silver preserving milk. Uh, silver used to be that way. They would put a silver coin in a milk jug, um, and I think the Amish still may do that. So uh, if um, so, if any individual's refinement of their time, intellect, and labor is the production of wealth, whereas uh, where the value is always subjective based on the individual's needs and desires, uh, then hopefully the listeners are beginning to make a connection that all human interaction is economic interaction. It doesn't matter again what Mises said. I, I didn't build any of this on what Mises had to say. I have no idea what he what he did with concerning praxeology. This is just what I've been able to figure out by going through and reading just. History, just actual paying attention to human interactions, what people did 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and even a couple hundred years ago. I mean it's pretty much all the same. It's a rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat with just different details. So what I found out uh, – uh, ended up uh, understanding uh, – it was a – it's a uh, complete and total breakdown in communication – uh, that followed the failure of societies to uh, self-reflect as a group, um, but not necessarily as individuals, uh, and then stand up to their groups as individuals. That that uh, this sort of the, everything that I've just talked about so far ended up being missed. People people always they always fail to see how each individual each individual act each individual's actions played a part in the whole grand scheme of things um, because everybody has time. Everybody has intellect. Everybody has labor. Everybody is uh, trying to acquire sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness. Everybody's trying to acquire all these things, and they don't look at, at this as an individual. They look at it as a collective because survival you know, in numbers way back in the day, you know, that's the way it was. Um, it was. It was humanity versus – versus nature and it still is uh it's just now more of a man versus man instead of man versus nature and so they so so people didn't didn't sit to try to figure this stuff out and that failure of the individual to self-reflect and understand how all human interactions uh are economic interactions and um let me uh, reiterate this 
uh, if self-ownership in whole and part is going to be invoked at all, it doesn't matter how much uh, someone may owe another. The fact of the matter is that most people refuse to self-reflect enough to figure out the concepts I have uh, relayed thus far and am only about a third completed in explaining. This is – this – I just don't understand why people don't take the time to think about this sort of stuff. I mean it's not overly complicated, and I'm not – I could read Liberty Defined and Morality Defined for everybody, but we don't – I'm pretty sure you don't have time for that. So they can get, anybody can get it for free if they want to go to my website. I Just download it, copy it, share it, print it. I don't care. Give it away. Just – take the time and go back and look for more of that. So because people don't self-reflect and think about these things and pay attention and make sure that their what their what they are their philosophies are are in are in lockstep with with their actions, meaning that their their actions have to be a mirror of their philosophy because they don't do that. And then they look at their philosophy and or they look at their actions and somebody else looks at it and says, I don't agree with that. And they and they start uh, – they don't communicate with each other to try to figure things out because they don't try to self-reflect to see if they're actually the problem or not. People jump to the conclusion of, well, you need to pay attention to to the, to the to my end game and not my means and then are quick to judge other people for their means and not their end game. So – it's it's terrible that that happens, and because people don't, uh, because people do that instead of instead of making sure that their means match exactly their ends, they end up not understanding that they have to recognize the value in themselves. They have to recognize the value in other people. Then they have to understand that the value doesn't matter; just the consent to being interacted with, the respect of that value has to matter, and. Respecting that value 100% outside of the realm of self-defense then becomes the basis of all morality. It is, in effect, the non-aggression principle. So we all choose to place value on our lives. doesn't matter how much value we place in our lives. What matters is that we place value on our individual lives and want that respected. Again, it doesn't matter how much respect we want. The default of respect outside of the realm of self-defense should always be 100%. Consent to being interacted with should always be 100%. But I have my critics who will say the seemingly obvious flaw of this that you can't just, that then nobody can talk to anybody. <laughs> you have to understand, everybody has to understand that there has to be just a tiny amount of give there so that you can communicate these ideas with other people in order to find out their borders, their boundaries. And as you become friends, then you can make crass jokes, then you can do all sorts of pranks and things like that. But until then, you have to understand where people sit on this philosophy, what, well, how much the respect that they want, and they have to build a rapport with each other. But until you or any individual understands that, that respect should always be 100%. Now, that it, because people don't communicate this, they don't, and I guess they can't communicate this because they don't think about this, they don't understand it. Um, people don't uh, recognize the uh, idea of um, or the value of uh, certain kinds of, I guess, uh, maybe self-reflection, and uh, it it's it's something that uh, hits me hard. Uh, mainly because of um, the way I grew up. Uh, so I had a dad, a very, very um, uh, hardcore disciplinarian uh, in the Army for 40 years, state employee for 40 years. And uh, so it's do as I say, not as I do. It was, it's, a, it's a probably better that I not go into that anymore. But um, – I was never able to actually ask questions without with uh, ask questions and and have them honestly answered without just being ridiculed terribly. But anyway, so so the whole idea about the morality 
and uh, this is true for any religion you look at. It doesn't matter. Any, any religion you look at, um, morality is always about protection and defense. It's about creating that barrier. So that's why you have to be able to – that's why consent, uh, respect of other individuals' value, whatever they place on – whatever value they place on themselves has to be 100 percent. Because every religion, it creates these rules where it, the rules are very subjective in terms of who they're allowed, who they apply to, and who they don't apply to. So ancient uh, religions, modern religions, and everything in between are trying to protect a certain class or group of people. So you won't be saved and protected unless you conform to these rules. Well, then once you conform to these rules, then you'll be promised the ability to live peacefully. You'll be promised the ability to refine your three natural resources. You'll be promised the ability to uh, satisfy yourself, uh, some some uh, invisible um, uh, overlord or, or deity or whatever will uh, protect you um, or guide you and give you wisdom in this life and protect you in some other life or whatever. But no matter what, it's always about protection. That's what that's what it is. But the core of, of, of morality is the non-aggression principle. It's about the respect, the recogni recognizing of your value and other people's value and respecting that. So anything that breaks or violates uh, that consent uh, between two individuals, and everybody holds to this, everybody, if there's anybody that doesn't hold to this, then something is wrong with their train of thought. It, it's not, it's, it, it quite literally is not normal. Um, meaning that they don't value, they don't have value over themselves or they don't see value in other people. And be, But I guarantee you that the vast majority of those people will still find value in themselves without wanting to recognize the value in others. And again, that's the core of the non-aggression principle, being that you recognize value in yourself and want it respected. You recognize value in other people. They want that respected. So what happens is individuals end up becoming they, – they, they, they find a common ground there, and they find out that one another – no, I don't, want, I don't want to fight you. I don't want to transgress against you. I just – I don't want to fight because there's a chance that I might lose. I might – you might take everything from me. So let's agree to just not transgress against one another. And I know it, it, it's not like we actually go out there and talk to people about this, but this is always talked about in growing up. Um, we, uh, we teach our kids not to hit. Um, not necessarily – a lot of us just say it's because it's, because it's wrong to hit somebody else. No, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily – because it's wrong to hit somebody else. It's because if you hit somebody else and you try to take their lunch, what if they hit you back and you don't get back up? Mm -hmm. That's that's the first reason. We can talk about that principle all we want that's just plain wrong. No, it's about protection and defense because if we try to take something from somebody else to satisfy any of our or, uh, basics of life, that we didn't refine ourselves, or we didn't we didn't refine whatever it is that we're trying to take from somebody else, and they successfully defend themselves. They may not be intent on ending our lives with one punch, but it could happen. And it, that's that right there is the is, is is the core of the non-aggression principle. It's about trying to set some sort of boundaries, verbal boundaries of some sort, some sort of communicated boundaries to where hey look. I value my life. I please respect it. I value your life. I won't attack you. That's that's the core of a non-aggression principle, and that's the core of every single religion out there. So when we begin to understand that others must have these similar concepts, we extend in some fashion of communication these other ideas uh, and what others should expect of us. And when we learn this, uh, we come to a common understand, understanding of, of uh, not aggressing against others and out of respect and recognition that they may retaliate justly against us. Now, the social contract, I think I brought that up previously. Um, th the non-aggression principle is actually the social con con uh, con um, contract. And unfortunately, and this is going, maybe it'll get me some flack. i not sure I care. Austin Peterson, if you're listening to this, <clears throat> You, sir, need to uh, understand that, uh, man, you did a very sorry disservice for the rest of us uh, debating Tom Woods. That was terrible. <laughs> um, actually, the non-aggression principle is a social contract, 
and it's from the bottom up. It's from the individuals working with individuals and agreeing to these things and then teaching that and moving up from there. Whereas social contract from government point of view where we all have to pay into this sort of thing there and be forced to it, that's a perversion of what the real social contract is. Now, social contract is, again, non-aggression principle, the basis of all religion and human and human interaction in, in terms of defense and protection. Okay, So the more people who do this, the more people who abide by the non-aggression principle, the more people who make this default in, the, in, in place of government, what is commonly accepted is that social contract and taxation then becomes a social contract. People are like to say, no, a contract has to have signatures and paper and guidelines and all this stuff. No, 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 it doesn't. How many contracts do we make every single day? How many agreements and interactions do we get with everybody every single day? We just understand that when we go through a grocery store and we pick up some items, we need to pay for them first before we can take them out of the store because they're not technically our property. It's an unspoken agreement that when we go into a grocery store and we put stuff in a shopping cart that is provided by the, gro by the store owners that we are going to load up this cart and walk to a cashier instead of right out the door. <laughs> we make those kind of little co uh, contracts every single day. I mean you walk into a store. You can walk out. The only two ways you walk out of that store peacefully are as if you pay for the stuff that you decided to pick up in that store. Or you put that stuff down and you walk out with nothing except for what you came in the store with. That is a that is an unspoken contract. The non-aggression principle, the unspoken contract. It's just part of. It's it's just it's 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 the social contract from the individual up. Whereas government is a social contract with coercion and force, unjust and unwarranted from the top down, from the collective to the individual, and it doesn't work. So, I think uh, with the uh, with people choosing to communicate with others to present their ideas and expectations um, of how they should be interacted with, uh, they develop the neutral point of all morality, and that neutral point is the non-aggression principle. This is the starting point for all that is moral and immoral. Anything that violates consent outside of the realm of self-defense, which includes the blatant refusal to listen to reason equally as much as the uh, blatant refusal to explain one's grievances, are all immoral acts. Anything, even even guilt, is a violation of the or can be a violation of the non-aggression principle. Um, I think in uh, in my book I use the example of a motorist stranded on the side of the road. Um, a lot of states uh, in the union uh, have this uh, thing where you have to stop and help, or you have to call nine one one, you have to do something. Well, if I didn't push that guy off the side of the road where he's now um, hanging on uh, to dear life by just a little thread and needs medical attention. If I don't stop, am I actually doing something immoral by not helping him? No, I'm not. Because I didn't – first, I didn't put him in that position. And second, I don't own him. I can do something that is moral by stopping and offering services to help him and ask nothing in return, sure, that's moral, but it's amoral of no negative or positive consequence for me to keep driving and keep going. Mm -hmm. Now, if if somebody says, well, you should have helped him, you're going to go to hell, and they're trying to change my emotional state to something other than what it already is and uh, something negative to what it already is, then that's a violation of the non-aggression principle and immoral. And so many people don't understand that. So when they use harsh language and debate against others, trying to they, – they, they, they slander people and throw um, uh, obscenities at people, and they're trying to uh, shake their, their, their uh, mental state so they make mistakes in debate so that they can claim victory. That's immoral because it's a violation of, 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 of their – of their state of of of, of, um, of the non-aggression principle because it, it changes their state of mind with intent to change their state of mind. So somebody screaming a, a string of obscenities, uh, f this, f this, f this, f you, f everybody else, and and your mother and your unborn children and all this, and that's like, why would you say that to somebody in the middle of a conversation 
if you weren't trying to change their, their, their state of mind. And then to say, oh, you have to be more secure in your mind. No, that, that, that's, that's, that's bull crap right there. That is bull crap. It is, it is intellectually dishonest, and it is just totally intolerable when it comes to holding a conversation with somebody. That, that's no better than, saying, than, than a cop or a soldier saying, I'm just doing my job. Now, you did that with vicious and malicious intent to cause somebody distress when that, when that sort of thing is, is, is thrown out. So yeah, guilt can be a violation of the non-aggression principle. So anything as far as moral goes, anything that improves the quality of somebody else's life or uh, helps maintain their life is a, is a moral act. Anything that, that hinders or holds somebody back from maintaining and or improving the quality of their life is an immoral act. Now apply that to taxation. Taxation is not voluntary beyond if you don't like it you better get out of this claim this 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 entity's claim of jurisdiction mm -hmm. if you don't like it so all government is immoral on that on that that the uh, set of uh, on that the set of guidelines there on that definition of the non-aggression principle and then you can get into ethics which is just another part of of, of the positive side of, of morality where it's just about maintaining a, a positive frame of mind and improving the frame of mind of other people and so on and so forth. And, but that's all I wanted to get across. I, I don't care what people think is moral. I don't care what people think what is good ethics. So long as anything that's being done is not negatively or positively affecting somebody else with intent to do so, it's simply amoral. I have no obligation to anybody else because – I can ask a price for, for helping the guy on the side of the road, and I'm sure he would pay it. Mm -hmm. But people would be like, no, that's immoral. No, it's not. <laughs> In economic terms, he's taking my time, intellect, and, and labor, and I can absolutely ask for something. People are like, well, you're a cold-hearted expletive. No, <laughs> I'm not. Just because you don't agree with how I refine my time, intellect, and labor – doesn't mean I'm wrong. Just because, and now see, if people are going to take that attitude, then they don't believe in self ownership. How can how can you own yourself, and then and then say, well, I have a moral obligation to do something? No, no, no. I want I want you to I want whoever's telling you that define what morality is. I want to know what morality is. Well, it's, it's the difference between right and wrong. Or I hear a lot. A lot of times, um, uh, people who don't know the difference between right and wrong are, are, are the problem in this world. No, the people who can't break down concepts and explain them to their core might be what's wrong with this world. That's and so, in a nutshell, that's how I led up to morality defined and got what I got what I got out of there. So, I know that uh, that was a lot. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't talked that long straight for a while now. <laughs> yeah, you covered a lot of concepts. <laughs> and in addition, you can read his book. <laughs> oh, there's uh, that. It's free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a great book. I, oh, both of them. I definitely highly recommend uh, everybody check his books out. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, you talked about a lot of concepts that uh, I could comment on. Um, yeah, the, the idea of objective morality or... Uh, and then, um, and then the children, um, and then, yeah, what is, you know, what is self-ownership and why is that important? Um, you know, people, especially, uh, you know, the communists or anarcho-communists like to point out that we can't own anything or, or even, or even talking about morality, like denialists, you know, say that, uh, you know, morality is subjective. There's no such thing as right and wrong. Maybe it's whatever's convenient at the time. Which is, which to me is really um, uh, just an excuse for uh, evil sociopathy and uh, kind of kind of do what I want when I please and screw everybody else. Right. Yeah, I think the, the nihilists are, are basically. I think they fall into the camp of I, I have I place value of myself. Screw you, but then they don't want to refine their own time, intellect, and labor to acquire what they want for themselves mm -hmm. to either either directly create it or to trade with somebody for what they've created. And that's just basically what nihilists become, I guess. Is that, is that right? Not nihilist? 
Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I think so. And uh, <laughs> actually, my wife kind of says that too. She likes this quote by Osho, which is, um, um, "There's no such thing as truth. There's only ways of seeing." <laughs> and it's very it's, to me that seems like a very nihilist um, notion, uh, which is which is also contra- contradictory, right? It's like saying that there's no truth except what this truth that i'm telling you right now (laughs) there's no truth except this truth (laughs) i've heard that before and uh i i I got to thinking about that a number of years ago and uh, what i've come up with for for people who have that is not so much what they're saying is like there's there's just ways of seeing things it's more of um there's more than one path to the same piece of wisdom Mm -hmm. and i think i think maybe that's what they mean instead of uh it's just multiple ways of seeing things. So, yeah, yeah, and I always equate morality with like um, uh, the laws of um, you know economics, laws of mathematics, um, laws of physics. In that, um, you know, just because there are people that practice bad mathematics does not negate the existence of mathematics. <laughs> and just because there, just because there are people that lie, cheat, you know, assault and kill and murder doesn't mean doesn't negate the idea that there is um laws of morality that um that are universal and that can be transgressed um frequently but uh, you know it's like it's like people say um uh you know there's 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 no way yeah there's no way to prove like like they try to concoct these various you know elaborate schemes where you know, um, I guess something could be construed as immoral or moral, and and so they kind of confuse it, and 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 like you know, like um, when we talk about uh, property rights, you know, like the the donut problem, where you know people, you know, let's say somebody buys rows around your <laughs> around your house, and you know, and never lets you leave, or or uh, or Larkin Rose made this one uh, this one example of you know, it's Im- it's immoral to to initiate aggression against somebody. So what if the entire world was going to like die or explode and you had to slap one person. Would you slap one person? <laughs> and it's like, uh-huh. that's like, <laughs> are you really going to go to that length to try to disprove a philosophical idea that it's immoral to initiate force against your neighbor? <laughs> oh, I, I, I can't stand some of those uh, scenarios. <laughs> they, they're, they drive me nuts. And it's... Uh, it's it's only worse when they refuse to define terms. Right. That's the biggest problem I have with people is that I'll lay something out. They will just make this massive assumption about what I meant, and they will take what they already know and apply it to what I just stated and then not ask questions and walk around claiming victory, waving a flag. <laughs> so I just, it's just – People don't know how to ask questions often enough, and they don't know how to say, "Hmm, I think I'm wrong," or "I'm not. I don't understand." Mm-hmm. So it's just just kind of one of those things where, <sighs> oh, it just frustrates me. But it's it's even more frustrating after I will explain to somebody that the basis of morality is the non-aggression principle. This is why. You see value in yourself. You know other people have value in them, place value in themselves. You want that respected. You come to some agreement there about how the two of you are going to um, respect that value in one another. And that is the beginning of the non-aggression principle and the beginning of all morality. So long as you don't violate somebody else's consent being interacted with after setting those terms. And they're like, see, see, I told you it's subjective. It's subjective because everybody can set their own terms. no. <laughs> the base part is always the same. It's always protection and defense. It's always the same. If the base is always the same, then everything else after that, fine. You can make it subjective as you want based on how well friend you get to be with these other people you're talking to. But the base is always the same, and the objective, the clear goal of this is protection and defense. To be able to refine your three natural resources as you see fit, and then to uh, provide for the four basics of life uh, to, to maintain and or improve the quality of your life. So people like to argue all the time, no, it's subjective. No, close your mouth. <laughs> quiet, quiet, quiet your mind. Just listen to this. Pay attention to all of the words and then go that route. And, you know, and I don't know everything. This is just what I have come up with on my own. 
I don't know anything about, about what, what Nisa said. I, and, and I've only started in the last, last couple of years or so to pay attention to the things that Mal Nua said and, and, and other individuals who are out there. And do I agree with a lot of them? Sure. Sure I do. Do I understand and claim that they're all wrong? No. Like, for example, uh, Molyneux did a thing on Star Wars recently where he picked apart Star Wars. And I've watched it a few times. And I'm, to my knowledge, and I, I might be incorrect, but I don't think he ever once mentioned that, oh, um, yeah, this story totally screws things up because it teaches girls that they can do whatever they want if they just close their eyes and do this. And I, and I know I'm, I'm not telling it exactly as it was, and I'm not doing that because I'm trying to, to skewer Molyneux. No, not at all. I, I think he's brilliant. It's just that I think he got this wrong because one p- crucial piece of, 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 of an idea that he missed was that, one, the story is not over. Episode 7 is not over. So it's not wrong for, for the character's development in, in, in that movie. Any of the character's development in that movie are to be, to be uh, considered uh, complete. Uh, or, or, or uh, their their, char- their characters to be a bad example. I mean, because they're incomplete, and uh, because of that, I think the the sentiment of, of what he was trying to show, uh, how how the movie is skewed and, and it hurts uh, the the, the uh, development of people and and how they people who look up to that sort of stuff. I, I think that was I think his general sentiment was incorrect. Now, if it was a standalone movie, that's fine. But in his in his uh, video that he did about that, he pulled from other parts of the movie. So clearly, it wasn't entirely about just that movie. So, and, and that movie, according to Disney, uh, canon for that movie is now uh, the Clone Wars cartoons, the Star Wars Rebels cartoons, I think, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Shadows of the Empire book. And a couple of new volumes of books that came out right before the movie that explain the history of of, uh, of the, some of the stormtroopers in there, and I think goes into the history of Rey and why she was where she was at and so on. But he didn't mention that, and and that's a big deal for me because as a as a huge Star Wars fan, mm-hmm. it's kind of like why are you dogging on something, and then you leave out so much stuff, and uh, and, and so everybody's capable of of making that mistake. It happens. Mm-hmm. They just, I think, I think a lot of people they, they get on the bandwagon of what they already know, and then they just kind of run with it, and then they make that one mistake, and it's like, oh, well, nah, I'm not going to go back and fix it because screw everybody else. Mm-hmm. But I think if I had a chance to actually talk to Molyneux about that, I would, I would absolutely debate him on that. Uh, I know my Star Wars, so <laughs> I'd, uh, I try to give him a run for his money. <laughs> yeah, when, uh, when I talk to people. On, uh, on Facebook, especially, um, and uh, you know, they comment on my posts, w- w- and they just throw around words that I'm sure they have no idea what the actual meaning is, like capitalism, socialism, black markets, um, you know, corporation, monopoly, taxation, and so to eliminate any confusion, I immediately go to the dictionary, like M- Merriam-Webster's dictionary, and just. <laughs> say this is the definition <laughs> and then and then I respond according to that basically because uh yeah so many people like you said they function based off of feelings you know that are like uh, incoherent and uh and they have no idea what they're talking about basically and it, it reminds me of the quote by um um by Murray Rothbard you know it's it's no crime to be ignorant of economics but but it's, uh, it's it's unforgivable to have a loud and vociferous opinion while remaining in that state of ignorance. <laughs> and that's so many people. It's amazing how many people. I guess that's uh, pretty much everybody who's uh, who's advocating for government, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, unintended consequences. Law of unintended consequences. Right. I, I, I uh, recently was watching uh, the debate with uh, Peter Joseph and Stefan Molyneux. Um. I don't understand half the things that were coming out of Peter Joseph's mouth. <laughs> I, I, it was lots of big words right. um, put together. And I, I couldn't get it. I mean, I understood a, I understood a lot, but as much as I understood come, that he was saying, 
there was equally as much that I didn't understand, and what I did understand was what seemed like blatant fallacies uh, on the grounds that um, uh, on the grounds that it's like the law of unintended consequences does not exist. Uh, and I, I see this so much from, from so many people, and uh, I, I am guilty of this, I think, from time to time myself. Um, I'm trying to fix that more and more every day. And, uh, I'm only human. At least that's what I want everybody to think. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but um, he, he, would, he would say something like, uh, market forces created government. But what I think he means is that because there is ample uh, wealth created and, and overcreated that's not necessary for the individual to maintain his life for that particular day, that that can be given away. And then somebody sees that and, uh, and says, oh, OK, well, they get greedy and they decide to take it and then they create government and government rises out of market forces because market forces, purely free market forces, which are meaning that there's no coercion outside of the realm of self-defense mm-hmm. or aggression or violence initiated, um, that somebody decides to initiate it says, oh, well, you have more than you need. It's OK. I'll take it. You didn't need it right now today anyway. No, but I, I still refined my three natural resources, mm-hmm. and I still own it because I own myself. And I think that right there, not being able to explain that to other individuals is the biggest flaw in the liberty movements uh, concerning, concerning trying to teach other individuals. So the rise of government uh, with the way uh, uh, this uh, individual was trying to, to debate with Molyneux was going was that – the market creates that. No, 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 no. The market does not create government. Government is created because somebody chooses to not refine his three natural resources into wealth to satisfy uh, one or more of his four basics of life or something that can be traded to satisfy those four basics. That's how government is created because is, think about it. What are the four basics? Sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness. What is government supposed to be? Security. Mm-hmm. So they take this from somebody, take this from somebody, take a little bit here, take a little bit there. Then, then, then these tributes now become taxes, and the children are taught to obey, and they totally don't understand self-ownership because they're part of a collective now that they're taught to obey. This is just the way things are done. And if people understood that, I think it would make a much bigger difference in how government is viewed. So, so far, I haven't found anybody who actually, um, in, in the two and a half, three years that I've been rolling with, with this set of ideas, I haven't found anybody to be able to actually break these concepts, at least um, not, not with the way I've defined them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, part of me hopes that they can't be broken. The other part of me is kind of hoping that Maybe I'm wrong because I want to know if I'm wrong or not, but I don't know because I don't have anybody to actually come up and just take my terms and and, and see how that works and how that holds up. Mm-hmm. So because you know, self ownership is just inherent; it just exists because it does. And that that's my pet peeve. The biggest pet peeve is um, people in the liberty movement saying something is just inherent. It just is because it is. it's just that's just the way nature is. No, we don't have a right to liberty and life and self ownership. I'm I, I'm terribly sorry, but okay, no, I'm not. The the universe doesn't care about you, me, the president, the the the, the, the country of, of of Egypt. It doesn't care about the continent of South America. It doesn't care about this pale blue dot. It does not care. The sun will explode. And it will take Earth and probably the next three planets with it in a few billion years. And what are we to do? To, does it care? No, it's going to do something. It's going to it's going to just take consume everything unless we create something like a solar rejuvenator to fix that. It doesn't care. The mountains will, will – some of them will explode and take out people and bury cities. It doesn't care. So it is just not natural, which is why I say that self-ownership, liberty, which is the – the exercising of self-ownership, and morality, which is the defense of self-ownership, are creations of sentient and reason-capable beings. Now, I did not say humans 
I said beings because you can take this 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 set of ideas and you can apply it to any any sentient and reason capable beings that we might acquire or come in contact with um, in the rest of the universe because they are willing to bet. What is it with uh, all these sci-fi movies they do? They're always – the aliens are coming to take our resources or they're coming to make an alliance with us to help protect their own resources. Think about that. It's always the same. It's always the same, and the only problem is communication. Hmm. So – Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think I'm very happy that you did write these books. And I think uh, people can derive a lot of benefit from them. So I urge people to visit your site. Um, so I'm, I don't, I don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, so please tell my listeners how they can reach you and, and follow your work. Uh, well, I uh, I uh, run uh, Liberty Defined, uh, facebook.com slash Liberty Defined. Um, occasionally, I make make a uh, post and appearances, I guess, on uh, Twitter uh, at Jim Limber Davis. And um, I try to uh, post content every once in a while on my website, uh, www.jimlimberdavis.com. And uh, I do try to respond to as many people as I can. Um, so if you have questions or anything and you want to know more, by all means, find me at any of those locations there. And um, I'm not against uh, possibly even doing some uh, – some uh, speeches. I, I don't mind doing that. Actual live performances and speeches. I, I wouldn't mind that. It'll change things for me, but uh, I'm not against it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, if anybody has any events uh, requiring a um, liberty minded philosopher, please uh, contact Jim. Help him spread the word because we all know that we need more people spreading voluntarism anarchy and, and free markets so there's not enough of us <laughs> i'm doing what i can as well with the uh, limited resources and limited time <laughs> at my disposal uh so so yeah so if anybody wants to help me out um you can do so uh bitcoin i have the links below bitcoin paypal uh or patreon that's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism uh please help me out i really enjoy Having wonderful guests like uh, Jim here, and I uh, want to continue to do so. And uh, monetary support is always in, is always a, a, a wonderful encouragement, <laughs> right? That's the that's the um, that's how you, you you know you vote with your dollars, right? It's the only democracy I support. Vote with your dollars. You want to see something more in the world. You uh, you put your dollars where where you want to see the future, right? To be so uh, so that's it. Thanks a lot, Jim, uh, for the conversation. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. So this is um, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and TheSeedsOfLiberty.com and TheConsciousResistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.